so it's 12 noon now standard eastern time so we will we will start the webinar on schedule we appreciate everyone joining us for our first webinar for the new master of digital product management program this is a, an academic offering that's been developed and launched in partnership and really in collaboration between the smith school of business and the queen's school of computing our first intake will be this coming september so between now and then we're hoping to have a number of these webinars and other virtual events and touch points to really educate prospective students as to what the digital product management program is all about and what the digital product management space is all about, kind of an industry writ large. So we appreciate you being here at the very beginning of that journey with this first uh, with this first webinar. So thank you very much. I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. So Queen's University acknowledges the facts that our campus is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. As a university, we are very grateful to be able to live, learn, and play on these lands. As far as an agenda for our webinar here today, we'll start with the definition of digital product management and kind of roll that into the opportunity that digital product management provides both within industries for companies that, that work in private sectors or other sectors across, uh, across various organizations, as well as the opportunity that participating in the program provides uh, to MDPM students as well. We want to speak in more detail about the partnership between the Smith School of Business and the Queen's School of Computing, as this is a true collaborative partnership academic offering. Then, of course, we'll talk about the program itself, the nuts and bolts, what it actually looks like when it will go into session starting this September. We want to speak about the student experience because that's something that's always incredibly important to us as we design and deliver these programs, making sure that all students have the best, most well-rounded experience as possible. And then if you come to a point over the duration of this webinar where you think that you'd like to apply, for the program, we will all additionally provide you with some application steps and what that process looks like going forward here. Of course, at the end, we'll leave room for a question and answer, and answer session uh, with, all, with all the panelists here. So when it comes to the questions, please type them into the Q&A section within the Zoom call here over the duration of the presentation. We might be able to address those questions over the duration of the, the presentation itself, but if not, we have left a dedicated Q&A session and a lot of time for that at the end of the presentation. As one final matter of housekeeping, please just know that anyone who registered for this event will receive a video recording of it after the fact, usually within 24 hours. So if you're on the call with us live now, thank you very much. It's great to see you and to host you virtually. If you're not able to stay right through to the very end, have no fear because we will email you a video recording of the entire session, as I said, within the next 24 hours here. So for the presentation today, I'm very happy to be joined by Nicholas Graham and Catherine Broman. Nicholas and Catherine are both the academic leads for this program, respectively from the Queen's School of Computing and the Smith School of Business. Um, as the academic leaders from their respective faculties, they've been collaborating and really working together very hard over the last couple of years, putting this program and the curriculum together. And they're also gonna teach a number of courses within the, the program curriculum. That leaves myself, my name is Connor McCann. It's very nice to meet you all. I'm the Associate Director of the MDPM program. I'll be responsible for interacting with applicants, students of the program, as well as liaisoning with industry just to ensure that we're constantly providing topical knowledge to our students and providing them with skills that can be applied directly to industry. So I'm kind of that industry plug for the program as well. So now I'd like to pass the baton over to, uh, to Catherine who will get us started with the definition of digital product management and why this is a space that we should all be very excited about. Great, thanks, Connor. I'm actually going to um, get Nick to help me with this slide because I think it's been an interesting um, sort of venture for Nick and I the last couple of years, really thinking about uh, what a digital product is. And it came across, you know, as we start to uncover more and more opportunities, one of the big observations we've had is that digital products are everywhere. And so there seems to be a bit of a um, different types of uh, explanations or definitions about what a digital product is. Sometimes we think of them as physical products. And Nick's going to talk to us a little bit about, you know, things like Amazon Echo or these different types of products that are emerging, a, a smartwatch. But then we started to think about them as services. So, you know, different ways that we're doing things now are really represented in the software that embeds itself within these products, like something like, an, uh, uh, like, like a new car, like I drive a Volvo Recharge, and there's a whole set of software capabilities inside of that. So Nick is the expert here. I'm definitely not. From the School of Computing, Nick is the one that has helped me really think about what these digital products are, how they're different, and so I'm going to turn it over to him to get us started. Well, thanks, Catherine. And as, as Catherine just said, we're all aware of the digital products we use every day, which could be the Photos app on our phones or even the website that we use to fill in our expense claims. 
But even things we think of as being physical artifacts um, can be digital products, things like cars or planes or even tractors. And these contain tens of millions of lines of code that control their operation, their user interface, their safety features, and even automation features. So every time you adjust your thermostat or you tell your smart speaker to skip to the next song, or even set your rice cooker to make the perfect bowl of rice, software is being deployed at the core of the product's operation. And because of this, products all around us in our regular lives um, require the creativity and the discipline and the fusion between business and technology that underlie the development of digital products. And so then the question is, what is a digital product manager? And, and so a digital product manager can really lead three different kinds of projects. The first is probably what people think of immediately, which is inventing the next phone app that's going to take the world by storm. Things like the way that Tinder has revolutionized the dating industry, or Google has completely changed the way that we search for information or for services or how MyFitnessPal has taken the boring mechanic of recording what you eat and has turned it into a fun and fast and socially supported digital task, things that weren't possible before. The second kind of role that a digital product manager can take is using digital approaches to turn traditional industries on their heads. So think about, for example, how Uber has completely changed the way that the taxi industry works or how Amazon has turned the bookselling industry upside down, or how Wealthsimple has revolutionized investment advising by allowing people direct control over their personal investments, which wasn't possible before. And then the third kind of project that a digital product manager could be involved in is rethinking how traditional businesses move their offerings to match the digital age. So think, for example, how Loblaws has moved from their traditional business, which was providing a store where people go to buy groceries, to providing a very sophisticated app that allows people to make their purchases online, roll up to the store, and then have someone bring their completed order to their car. Or how Manulife, which is a traditional insurance company, has brought out an app that now allows you to make claims by scanning receipts on your cell phone and having them immediately processed. And so more and more industries um, are undergoing digital transformation. And so it's key for incumbent industries like insurance companies and grocery stores to find ways of moving their offerings to the digital age. So no matter which of these kinds of project matches your path, expertise in digital product management is something that's going to be key. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what digital product management is, because it's actually an interesting intersection of a whole bunch of stuff we've done before. And so if you think about breaking this down, product management is something that's been managing by marketing organizations forever. So if you think about new product development, right, how do we ideate these new opportunities? But much of that's happened within the physical space. So thinking about a new cereal or a new car, these are all very physical products. On the digital side, we've often thought about new development or innovation in the idea of IT development or systems development. And so it uses a very different approach than product management. And so really digital product management sticks those two things together from a business perspective. And so we've got the product management lifecycle being really cradle to grave where we have you know, uh, somebody within the business owning this product. So if you think about experiential learning as a product, if you're a consulting company or a, a higher ed institution, you're thinking about how do we better engage clients or help our students really experience real world phenomenon. You can think about that as a product. That is something that is a school or a consulting organization is trying to get better at. And so you're managing that as a product, really, something that is living from the beginning of its ideation all the way to the end. It could be 10 years, it could be 15 years. And then the digital piece is how we embed new opportunities or new functionalities, leveraging technology to change the way that people might experience learning. And so that really brings in the technology management piece. So what's interesting about digital product management, it's both a role the digital product manager, 
and a function, which is digital product project management, product management. And so when you think about these two things, it starts to really, you start to really get clarity as the fact that the function itself is actually much bigger than the role. So there's many different types of roles that you would see within the digital product management sphere. Like you might be a business analyst. That's somebody that's feeding into the product management opportunities. And those people, although they might not consider themselves digital, are actually part of the product management function. And so the role itself, the digital product manager, is certainly a role. And we're seeing more and more people in the next slide. We're going to talk about the growth in this role. But as a function, it's really making us in the business school anyway, really rethink this IT project management construct and how it relates to this more marketing product management capability. And so in, in the business school here at Smith, we've actually stuck those things together. So our digital technology group is working really closely with our marketing group to uncover the opportunities um, that really exist within this function. And I might actually turn to Nick quickly here because he's got a whole other story in the School of Computing that's going on about really understanding this function. So Nick, do you mind to talk a little bit about the disciplines that you're bringing to the table in this program? Yeah, so for example, we have the domain of human computer interaction, which is um, uh, very much uh, tied towards understanding users' needs and um, where those needs fit within an organization, identifying the different stakeholders and be able to move that forward. Um, we have um, software architecture, which is trying to understand what um, facilities are currently in place and what structures are currently in place that a new product has to be able to work within. Um, we worry a lot about security and privacy, which is something that um, for digital products nowadays is a huge concern, making sure that people's data doesn't leak out in ways that are unintended. In, in general, to make a product um, successful, a digital product manager is required as, as someone who bridges the gap between business and technical needs. Um, and that means trying to understand the gap between user needs and product design or the gap between desired function and technical realities of what really can be built, or of understanding the gap that between an initial prototype that just shows off the idea and a fully scaled, prod, uh, fully scaled product that can actually be deployed. And all of these have to be done while balancing the concerns of um, usability, security, and privacy. And so that means that someone fulfilling a digital product management role needs to be able to talk the language of senior business management and also the language of their technical team. And they need to be able to set design direction and technical direction and to understand how the product will grow with its market. And these are the skills that we emphasize in this program. So I think this really leads to the conclusion that it is the golden age of, of product management and you don't have to take our word for it. We have pulled some statistics from industry that kind of allude to this being the golden age of product management as well. Uh, over the past five or six years, we've seen a 29% year on year growth in product, product management job, job openings. Um, in addition to that, we have really seen the rise of chief product officer as the newest member of the C-suite. And it's really this combination of technical skills paired with usability, customer facing skills that organizations are, are valuing that they're really looking for in product managers. And you can see how much organizations value those skills just by looking at some of the starting salaries captured on the screen here. Um, it's not only a career that's, that's you know, financially rewarding, as it certainly is, but it's also one that can be implemented to drive change through our organizations and through society writ large. So it is kind of rewarding on more of an intrinsic level as well. And that's one of the reasons why Catherine, Nick, and myself are so excited about this, this new academic offering. When it comes to the offering itself, again, this is a program that's delivered in partnership with the Smith School of Business and Queen's School of Computing. And it's really important to note on the fact that this is not a simple rebundling, rebranding of courses that already exist within the business school within the, the School of Computing. This is a wholly new academic offering. Nick and Catherine have been collaborating and working very intensely over the last three or four years, creating wholly new content that will comprise at least 60% of the curriculum for the MDPM program. So it's about taking concepts from the school of computing and business concepts and using those 
to collaborate and develop brand new academic content um, for, the, for the majority of the content that will be delivered over the duration of the program. One of the interesting things about that, and this has certainly been Catherine and Nick's experience in working together and collaborating to develop this curriculum, is that the perspectives are, are often very different. You can have a, the same issue, the same topic at hand, and you know, a, a technical, pure play technical approach or perspective will be very different than the business approach or perspective. And one of the great things about the MDPM curriculum is that we provide students with both of those perspectives, and that really heightens the learning for everyone involved. So over and above the benefits that this partnership bestows upon the academic content for the program, it also allows the MDPM program to leverage skills that are inherent or kind of situated in both of these respective schools. On the Smith School of Business side, we have lots of experience with delivering remote, the virtual, team-based, coach-reliant programs. We also have a whole constellation of career support that's available to students of all Smith programs, and those would certainly be available to MDPM students as well. On the School of Computing side of things, we also hope to work with that team to leverage and develop a brand new virtual learning platform. Smith School of Business wouldn't have the skills uh, internal to our school to develop that new virtual learning platform. So we're really tapping into the resources and the skills of the School of Computing to help us develop a brand new virtual app, vir virtual learning platform that will, again, heighten the learning for everyone involved. So this partnership bestows advantages to students of the program in multiple ways. And it's, again, one of the most exciting features about this program. And we really look forward to continuing to collaborate with the next team. So the, the program itself is um, 12 months. And I think that you know, we'll get into later kind of what the courses look like. But I think the big opportunity here is looking at the fact that it, it's teaching you a modern management practice. And what that means is it, it in a lot of ways, it's actually um, pushing on some of what I would define as the older management practices. And so a lot of what we talk about is is how we're doing business or generating revenue or serving our customers in the digital age. So digital as a concept in this program is the age that we're living in. That is different than many people want to put digital as kind of a technology artifact. And so what we're doing, doing is talking about product management in the digital age. And to do that, we need to create this connective tissue that Nick and I have been talking about between kind of how we've perceived technology management and the role of technology and the business as a function. And so unfortunately for people who really sort of have a fear for technology, the opportunity really is to say it's time, right? It's time that we stop sort of deferring a lot of these capabilities to our IT organization or consultants. And we embrace this, this idea that technology in today's day is especially accessible. You know, Nick's going to talk later about this no code, low code offering. And the whole idea that, you know, gone are the days that you, even though you're maybe not that technical, that you can't play in this space. And that's a huge part of the design of this program. It's meant to be for people who want to manage the process of and the capabilities of digital product management. And so the result that we have here is really bringing in a lot of technical concepts with regard to emerging technologies and how to use data. But we also talk about the change, right? So how do we manage the change? How do we really think, be, be thoughtful about the fact that everybody is currently probably using all the tools and capabilities they want to? And so how do we infuse new ways of doing work? And coming off the heels of COVID is such a huge opportunity for this program because it's forced us in many ways to think about how to leverage technology. And so many of us, you know, remote work, remote learning are all things that technology solutions that have been around for over a decade, but we, for the first time, really used them as a way to transform the way we work and the way we live. And so the opportunity right out of COVID and the timing of this program is absolutely um, essential with regard to, because right now there's an appetite inside many organizations to really think about how to evolve their practices into the digital age. And so moving forward into the program, we've got sort of this idea of the program structure. And we're going to talk about the faculty and industry connections, student experience, and career advancement center. And so I'm going to turn it over to Nick to talk about the program structure. So the 
Master of Digital Product Management is based around three parallel streams. Um, the first, the knowledge stream, uh, consists of courses bringing foundational knowledge in the program's core areas. And um, Catherine in the next slide is going to talk about some of those areas uh, in more depth. The application stream consists of hands-on courses that apply this foundational knowledge to real-world problems. And in parallel, the students engage in a project with a real customer uh, where they work on designing and developing an actual digital product. It should be obvious from what we've discussed so far that digital product managers are not people who spend their days cranking out code. And so in this program, we don't teach and we don't expect coding knowledge directly. But digital product managers do need to be able to do things like developing quick proof of concept prototypes that explain their ideas. And they do need to be able to direct technical policy around the development of their product. And they do need to be able to make strategic technical decisions. And so to support this, as Catherine was alluding to a moment ago, um, we'll introduce you to a suite of no code or low code tools, which are accessible without programming skills. And we'll introduce technical concepts at the conceptual and policy level that are appropriate for the DPM position. In addition, we recognize that most people can't leave their jobs to do this master's program. And so classes are scheduled in the evenings and on some weekends, allowing students to study while working full time. Um, so more specifically, the program runs for a year starting in September. Um, classes are scheduled in the evenings and on some Saturday mornings. The offerings remote so that students can participate from their own homes. Um, we start each year though with an intensive kickoff week physically here in Kingston, Ontario. Uh, and with the idea that the class can get to know each other and establish a common grounding of some basic material um, before the remote portion of the program begins. And the program as a whole provides a great deal of support and community through, for example, professional coaches, which are um, offered by the Smith School of Business, um, as well as ongoing support for creating your own professional network and advancing your career. Thank you, Nick. So I'll kind of pick up there and just talk about the team-based learning aspect of the MDPM program. All of the graduate programs within Smith's portfolio of master's and management programs and MBA programs, they all have a team-based aspect. We think that as business practitioners, it's incredibly important for everyone to learn how to work effectively uh, as part of professional teams. And anyone on this call who has any semblance of work experience will know that it's very important to collaborate with others and to work on teams across industries, across sectors, across roles. Um, and, you know, those professional teamwork skills don't come inherently to everyone. So over and above providing students with an incredible academic education, we also want them to use the program as a bit of an incubation period and an opportunity for them to hone their people management and also hone their professional team work skills in a very safe and collaborative environment. And the MDPM certainly isn't excluded from our team-based approach to, to, to academics here at the Smith School of Business. Um, specifically with the MDPM program, that team-based aspect will take place with a nine-month practicum where teams of between five and six MDPM students will actually be paired with a real world client and they'll work with that client to derive value and to deliver value to the client through the implementation of some sort of digital technology. So students will have the opportunity to work and collaborate with each other and also work and collaborate with a client as well and really become and hone their, 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 their management skills in addition to their ability to work effectively with others in a professional capacity. Um, like everything we do here at the Smith School of Business, we provide a lot of a structure with the team-based delivery and aspect of the program. Teams will work intensively with a dedicated team coach at the start of the program just to ensure that the teams have the right forms and norms in place that will effectively allow them to, to build out and work effectively together throughout the entire duration of the program. Each team will also be paired with a professional industry-based project advisor who is kind of a, you know, an expert within the digital product management space and kind of guide them through the delivery of that, of that project to, to the client as well. So that's another really exciting aspect of the program. And now kind of, as you'll see kind of from the, the curriculum here that the experiential learning is really just kind of one of the three main facets that kind of comprise the overarching curriculum for the MDPM program. And at this point, I'll pass it over to Catherine to kind of speak to all three of these streams in turn. 
Great. Thanks, Connor. So the one thing I, I would imagine that many people on the webinar is like, what, what courses am I going to take? I mean, that really is what it comes down to. Nick and I can grandstand all we want about how great this is, but it's like, well, that's, when the rubber hits the road, what am I going to learn? And so really, this is what this slide is all about. Um, and it goes through some pretty major topics. So around the idea of, you know, introduction to digital product management as a discipline, as a practice, what does that look like is how we kick things off. And what's most interesting about this is that this is actually being built as an academic thought leadership exercise. You know, many of these digital product management or product management practices, they exist, right? We see them come out of Google, come out of Amazon, come out of Silicon Valley. So there's a whole suite of practices that are around the idea of design thinking and user experience. But what's missing is this idea of how this actually enables organizational change and how it changes people's behavior. And that's really what you learn at the beginning and throughout this program is there's a real academic layer of understanding about how we do this well and why it matters. And so you'll learn about digital strategy. So going right back into economics and really understanding why the digital age is changing the basis of competition. So one of the key things in that comes to the idea of like moving from kind of a competitive landscape to more of a, a collaboration. So companies working together, even collaborating with competitors, what does that even look like? And what does that mean for strategy? Then we go over to our computing colleagues to give us an overview of what the emerging technologies are. So these change every year. So right now we're really fascinated with blockchain and AI and many of the different um, elements that are coming out of those technologies, but they will change. And so this is really giving you a refresh and some language around those emerging technologies. We have to talk about ethics. Right, the idea that there is a downside to digital products, and we want to understand what that the ethical implications are, and making sure we're building digital products for good, right, and and really understanding what that means. We have some data driven decision making, understanding that data sits at the core of many of these digital products. So, what does that decision making process look like? And then we're going to talk about experimentation. So, this is again a whole new practice around how we implement these digital products. So, we want to test and learn, and building these organizational experiments draws right into our strategy group within Smith. So we have a strategy uh, scholar that's going to teach that. Then we, again, we go back over to the School of Computing to talk about bringing some expertise on security. Nick's expertise, which is why he's so amazing to have in this program, is around gamification and usability. So it's these are the things that business scholars don't understand, right? And that's why we need the School of Computing to come in and really give us the thought leadership around these, um, these topics. And then I mentioned earlier the, the importance of our marketing colleagues. And so Jake Brower, who I'll introduce in a second here, has, you know, he comes in from our marketing organization to talk about digital product marketing and really understanding how we leverage data to amplify and, and scale our digital products. And then lastly, we got to talk about leadership. Right. So it's like, how do I lead these? So the interesting one quote I get from a lot of the people that I've worked with in designing this program is digital product managers have to influence hundreds, but they have authority over none. And so this whole idea of how do I lead that? How do I influence the organization outside of my silo, you know, and, and navigate leadership when I really don't have any legitimate power? And so that's the knowledge stream. And this is all taught by Ph.D. academics people who study this as, as part of their research, and they are the thought leaders um, in their specific disciplines. The application stream walks you through a set of courses that's going to tell you how to do this. So many of you have probably heard about design thinking. That's a course, right? What is design thinking? How do we use those practices to discover new opportunities? Then we'll talk to you about systems thinking. Different, but equally important. But how do we change the system that surrounds us? Much of digital transformation is changing from an existing way of doing things to a new way of doing things. To do that, we need to understand the system. So things in that, like just understanding and mapping the business process as a starting point. But then how do we identify these barriers and challenges within the system to drive change? So that we'll talk about. Then we go into prototyping and evaluation. And so this, is, again, is another one of those integrated courses because business and computing look at this topic differently. So that's a whole course around how do we prototype? How do we evaluate the impact? A course on product analytics, which really br brings in industry practices around how we leverage data and, and customer information to evolve and make our products better. 
optimizing the user experience goes into UX, so user experience design and really understanding how to take feedback from our users and enhance their experience. And then finally, the integration of the digital product to the existing infrastructure. So the existing technology infrastructure, how do we stick those together? We'll talk about APIs. We'll talk about a number of different ways that we're going to integrate that product into the existing system. And finally, we got to scale. So how do we leverage the cloud, You know, push that product into scalability opportunities? And as Connor mentioned, this is all, those are the courses that all feed into this nine month experiential learning stream. And so you get your projects in around November and we work all the way through for the nine months with an industry um, advisor and team coaches to really make sure that experiential learning opportunity is maximized in terms of its um, learning outcomes. So if we move on now, I just wanna introduce you briefly to the faculty. And, um, and so this is, who we are. So Nick and I are, um, you know, sort of experts in our own, uh, you know, sort of areas of research. And so I do um, a lot of work around strategy and change and technology, digital transformation. Nick's areas of expertise, gamification, machine learning, you know, user experience design. Now, Jake Brower, you haven't met, but he is um, certainly somebody that you could reach out to if you want to learn more about the marketing role. And, um, and then the Ahmed is uh, a really, and this is a, um, Ahmed is a really leader. I'm going to actually let Nick talk about Ahmed because he's actually a world renowned software development um, and influencer and, and thought leader. And so I might pass it over to Nick quickly to talk about Ahmed because I think he deserves a bit more explanation than I'm aware. So Nick. So he is going to be teaching our um, units on software architecture and system architecture. And uh, this is basically looking at how to structure large and complex pieces of software. Um, Ahmed holds, uh, for example, the key patents um, from BlackBerry on their BlackBerry network from back in that era and is um, listed as among the top five um, most cited um, software engineering academics um, in history and so has had uh, enormous um, impact in those fields of um, software and systems architecture, um, DevOps, um, and um, general software quality and understanding how to build software that is robust and scalable. Thanks, Nick. So these are, again, just an introduction to a few of us. Um, our other faculty are on our website. You can take a look at, at what they do. And, but specifically, I encourage you to look at their research. Um, because they're all, as much as their industry, they have industry experience, you know, we've, we've done this in the industry, they're also thought leaders in terms of really driving this academic thought leadership. So next slide, if you don't mind, Connor, I want to talk a little bit about the advisory board. And so not only are the faculty influencing the content in this program, but we have, we're just starting to ramp up our advisory board. And these are some really key players that represent different parts of how digitalization and digital transformation is impacting society. So Gord Sanford is a partner of Digital Transformation, the Future of Work at EMY. And so his background is really around the idea of ideating what new societies look like. And so he spent some time at Deloitte prior to this, but he's really helping us understand the future of work and transformational practices. Stefan Cousineau is, has always been a change agent in the federal government. So he was involved in... Uh, I think Catherine, we've lost your connection, but um, involved in the development of the uh, Sportsnet apps, the Sportsnet Now, that um, allow us all to watch sports games on our mobile platforms. Go ahead, Nick. Okay. And so I think that um, tells us uh, that this board that is growing brings significant expertise in the areas um, surrounding digital product management. And they guide us by helping us um, at each step as we come up with curriculum ideas and management ideas within the program, they guide us to make sure that we're on track. O'Connor, I think we can move on. 
Absolutely, I'd be happy to pick up the discussion here and kind of talk about these, the student experience over and above kind of the academic delivery and all the exciting things happening within the curriculum of the program. It's also important to you know, make sure that this is a holistic approach and that students you know, enjoy the, the program and derive many different forms of, um, of experience and meaning from it. So I'll kind of speak to that in turn here. So specifically, we're gonna look at the residential session, the earn and learn platform, as well as the experiential learning aspects of the program. So the program, as Nick alluded to earlier, kicks off with a one-week residential session right here in Kingston, Ontario, lovely Queens campus in, in Kingston, Ontario, a city that Nick, Cap, and I are all very fond of as we kind of, uh, we have some history here. Um, lovely city located right on the banks of, of um, Lake Ontario, um, lot, lots of great restaurants and bars and just generally a great place to be, especially in the fall months when all the leaves change colors. I've heard these residential sessions and it's something that we have experienced delivering across our portfolio of graduate programs here at Smith School of Business. So I've heard students uh, refer to these residential sessions before as adult summer camp. I guess in the, in the case of MDPM, it'll be like more of an adult fall camp because it does take place in the fall months. But I think that just really alludes to the fact that there is a lot of joy to be derived from these residential sessions. It's intensive, it's a lot of work. You're meeting your, your classmates and your teammates, you're interacting with faculty and the various members of the, the MDPM program staff. You know, there's, there's class and there's projects that you're working on, you're collaborating, but there's also a lot of fun baked into these residential sessions. Social events, you'll be staying right downtown um, in a hotel that's within walking distance to the best restaurants and bars um, in Kingston. So over and above all the hard work that you will be doing over that week, it's also a great amount of fun and something that will certainly be um, a standout um, memorable experience of, of your overarching MBPM program experience. So the virtual learning platform, again, we alluded to this earlier, this is something that Nick and his team over at the School of Computing are, is helping us to develop for the, the launch of the MDPM program. So this would be a platform that only MDPM students have access to. And it's really just to enable students to kind of play, collaborate, and learn together in, in a more of an engaging way than just sitting on a Zoom call and having material kind of, um, you know, provided to you uh, through, through a traditional lecture. So it's the ability to collaborate, learn, and play with, with other of your classmates, um, all facilitated through this, this virtual platform that we're building out specifically for the MDPM program. And again, thanks to Nick and his team for helping us put that together. Over and above the synchronous aspects of the program, and there certainly will be many synchronous lectures and uh, various workshops that we'll be deli delivering to students over the duration of the program. There will also be uh, a fair amount of, of asynchronous content. So this is content that students can work through kind of on their own schedules. And I think that this really allows the program to be that much more flexible. So you're not required to be online at predetermined times for the entire duration of the program. We will provide you with some material that you can work through at your own time and on your own schedule. And that really just makes it that much more flexible and makes it easier to balance the requirements of the program with everything that you have going on in your professional career and personal life. Again, the experiential learning, we, we've talked about this a little bit when it comes to the, the practicum, the nine month practicum that student teams within the MDPM will be executing um, in, in combination with their advisor, the coaching staff here and delivering, ultimately delivering value to, a, to an end client. Um, so it's all about taking everything that we've learned through the knowledge and application streams and kind of taking that to the nth degree with this experiential learning screen stream and you know teams will deliver real value to real organizations and that's really something that they can hang their hats on and a great experiential learning piece and something that will really allow them to transition seamlessly from the program um, into industry and, and leverage all those skills as they go along so finally here i want to touch upon the career resources the entire constellation of career resources that are available to students of the mdpm program and these are delivered predominantly through our career advancement center which is a fully staffed physical office that's located right in our business building here on Queens campus. All the resources of the Career Advancement Center are available virtually and they were available virtually even well before the pandemic. So we have a lot of great experience in delivering all these resources and services in a virtual capacity as that will be uh, the program experience for the majority of the time for MDPM students. I quickly wanna go over kind of the framework that our Career Advancement Center uses when helping students to leverage all, the, all of these great resources. Um, when it comes to sourcing out a new job or potentially making a, a transition in your career, the first thing to do is, is, is self-discovery. There needs to be some self-assessment, some self-awareness. You need to effectively determine for yourself where you want to go. And we can provide you with some tools and assessments to help you come to that conclusion. Once you have that guiding light, you have an idea of what kind of maybe your short, medium, or long-term professional goals are. That's when you have to put the work in. You have to build up your profile to put you in a position to kind of execute on what that goal is. And again, this is probably where the bulk of the work takes place and we provide all the resources to help students get there. Once they've 
made the discovery, they know where they want to go, they put in all the labor to help them get there, then it's a matter of execution. And that's the launch stage. That's the job search. It's, you know, attending recruitment events, um, mock interviews. And then once you do secure a position, it's post, post offer negotiations, salary, whatever it may be. So this is a full suite service that we offer to all students of the MDPM program, right from discovery through to launch. Another crucial point that I want to raise here is the fact that these resources are available to MDPM alumni as well. So you might not be in a position or you might not be in a place in your career right now where you feel like you need that professional change and that you would benefit from leveraging all these career resources. That's absolutely no problem. But five or six years down the road, 10 years down the road, you might want to be you might want to make some sort of professional transition. At that point, you can reach back out to our Career Advancement Center as an alumni of the MDPM program and leverage all those resources as if, as if you're actually a student. So it's just a great thing to have in your back pocket over the entire duration of your career. So next steps, if you kind of come to uh, the, the point where you think you might be interested in applying for this program, good news is that all applicants of the MDPM program are assigned their own dedicated application advisor to guide them through that entire application process. Even better news for applicants currently for the MDPM program is that I will be that application advisor, so I'll be the one responsible for guiding applicants throughout the process. Um, if you're at a point, kind of maybe an interim point where you think you might be interested in the program, but you're not sure whether you want to apply yet, I'd always be happy to connect for a one-on-one -on -one consultation. We can talk about the program and about your own unique situation in more detail to help you make that determination as to whether or not the program is a good fit for you. I'm also more than happy to conduct what we refer to as a preliminary assessment. So if you're interested in the program, but you're not sure if you meet all the, the requisite requirements, uh, you can just send me a copy of your resume and transcript. I can review those documents and give you a very good indication as to your eligibility for the program. If at that point you're not eligible, I'm always happy to provide feedback, maybe some steps you can take um, you know, in the next two or three years to kind of put yourself in a position to qualify for a future intake of the program. If after that initial consultation or that preliminary assessment, you're interested in moving forward with an application, I can guide you throughout that entire process. It consists of a cover letter, a statement of diversity, providing some references, an updated resume, uh, transcripts, all those normal kind of facets that go on with an application to graduate school. Um, and that will culminate in an interview with Catherine and myself uh, to make the ultimate kind of admission decisions. So we operate under a rolling admissions model for the MDPM program, which means that there are no hard application deadlines. So we launched the program just over three weeks ago now. We're already working with a number of applicants. We'll continue to work with those applicants, build out their application profiles, conduct interviews, make admissions decisions, and effectively fill the class right from now through to when the class is full. We're aiming for a cohort of 40 students for the first intake of the program in September. Uh, we don't really have a crystal ball, and because this is the first intake, we don't have any past data to rely upon when it comes to exactly when we think that class will be filled. Um, but a word to the wise would just be to move forward with your application sooner rather than later. If this is something that you're interested in, I would certainly encourage you to move forward with an application as doing so earlier in the cycle will ultimately put you in a better position to secure admission once there are more seats at this point available than there will be in the middle or towards the end of the recruitment cycle, whenever that may be. And it's completely free to apply. So you, you really have nothing to lose financially by applying. And at the very least, I'd be happy to give you some feedback as to how you could potentially make your profile stronger for, for a coming intake of the program. These are the fees for the program, both domestic and international. Um, worth noting here is the fact that these fees are, are inclusive to a great extent. Tuition, books, learning materials, access to all the learning platforms, the virtual learning platform that Nick and his team are building out, that, those are all included within these, within these program fees. The one thing, the one material add-on that you will need to factor into the program fee is this your travel to and from Kingston. So for the residential session um, that kicks off the program, meals, accommodations, transportation within Kingston are, are covered in these tuition fees as well. But the one thing that you will need to factor in is just transportation to and from Kingston. So whether that's you know a, a train ride or a bus ride or a tank of gas or maybe a flight, if you're located further away, you'll have to factor that in. Uh, but for by and large, these, these course fees are inclusive. So we just wanna thank you again for taking the, the time here to join us for our first ever webinar for the MDPM program, where uh, we're very excited about it. Um, and I guess the question is, are you, are you ready to throw your hat in the ring with an application and kind of um, talk to me and, and move forward with your career? So thank you very much. And now we'll open the floor to, uh, to questions. Great, Connor. I might just, now that I'm back, I sort of dropped off there for a minute, but um, I just, I might highlight just quickly the steering committee part, because I sort of threw that over to Nick and he was not prepared for that. Sorry, Nick. Um, four people that I wanted to highlight, and, and this speaks to the idea of, of what industry you're coming in from. Um, so I was, I was talking about Gord, you know, at EMY, really helping us understand this virtual learning platform and what that looks like. 
but he also comes in from the consulting side. So I think many people that are, you know, currently maybe is business analysts, there are business analysts in that consulting role, right? Really trying to really understand how to embed this, these digital changes or digitalization opportunities. Stefan Cousineau in the federal government. So we're seeing a lot of opportunity within government entities, Indigenous Services Canada, you know, uh, farming and agriculture. Everybody's trying to rethink their ministries for the digital age and what that looks like. So he's really helping us understand that intake. Jessica Crisis is our the our board chair. And, um, you know, she's the vice president of strategic growth and data sales at Cineplex uh, Media. So what's interesting about Jessica is she's actually got a computing degree. So so she's now you're know, really helping us understand how to embed uh, those technical skills into this digital product role. And then Tolu, um, you might have seen him as part of our webinar a few weeks back, but he's actually doing the job. So he's at Sportsnet trying to understand this streaming line of business. And again, we're building out this advisory team very much to try and identify these different learning stream opportunities. So, so that's our advisory board. So we're not building this program within the confines of academia. Uh, we really are reaching out into the industry and trying to understand how these, this practice is evolving across those different industries. And so I just wanted to um, finish that up, Connor, because I got dropped off earlier um, with those technical difficulties. Yeah, no problem at all. Catherine, really appreciate you kind of circling back to that. So as far as the Q&A is concerned, anyone on the call, please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A function just embedded within the Zoom call here. Um, and I'll just kind of moderate the questions that have come in so far, uh, read them out in turn. Is product management experience required to qualify for the program? So I don't know, Catherine, if you wanted to speak to that. Sure. So um Product management experience proper is not a requirement. So the, what we are looking for is a couple years experience as a minimum, just that you understand this whole idea of how a business is um, operating around this sort of creation of these new technology enabled capabilities. And so definitely we want a bit of experience. Um, and then it's interesting when you think about the product management role, because I would argue no matter where you come in, you're you're, you're in it, right? So you're, you're probably touching it from, you know, a specific role within your organization. And so many people I expect won't come in with, with product management proper experience. It's, but, but if you're interested, I expect you've seen it in your current role. So the short answer to that is no, you do not need that experience coming in. You know, it is a competency that we develop over time. Um, and, and I think the biggest thing we're looking for in terms of is this program right for you is just your intrigue with how technology is changing the way people work, the way you, you know, connect with your customers, your clients, your partners, just really a passion around how this is all um, changing practices in a digital age. Great. We have another question here that's addressed to Nick, but uh, Catherine, you might want to, to pipe in here as well. So I will kind of pass it over to Nick, but I'll just read the question out for everyone's benefit on the call. I heard Nicholas note that product managers are to lead and or direct technical policy or make these decisions within an organization. Can you speak a bit more about what skills will be taught to provide this leadership ability? Is it always the case that these policies are led by the organization and there is minimal influence lead that employees can have? So again, I'll, I'll give it to Nick here as the question was addressed to you. And then Catherine, please feel free to circle back in as well. So I, I love this question. could probably talk for a half hour on just this one thing. And, and so I won't. But starting, if, if you're in, for example, a traditional industry, which is going through a digital transformation, it's absolutely true that you need buy-in from the senior management of the company to be able to do the things that need to be done to, to push forward that digital transformation. That, um Often the whole reason that the transformation is required is that the industry is moving or that an opportunity is seen to move in a digital way that was not um, something that your company was currently doing. Um, so the question is, hopefully that buy-in is already there, but if the buy-in isn't there yet, what do you need to do to be able to push it forward? A large part of that is being able to make a very prepared case that hits on both the business sides and the technical sides. And that's where having the kind of depth of expertise that you get from the wide range of courses that um, Catherine was discussing will help a great deal. Also, you know, just as an example of that, um, any traditional industry 
will typically still have a fairly significant IT backend and IT core that, that you will need to be building on. So coming in with a plan, which um, involves throwing everything away and starting from scratch, is not a realistic plan. And so that's why understanding system architecture, understanding the tools and systems and, and processes that are currently in place, and being able to make a good argument about what needs to be built that's new, and what um, should be built upon and, and transformed to the, the new purposes is important. So I think that's the, the ultimate core of my answer is that, that we provide this great breadth that allows you to go into those senior management meetings, being very prepared for the discussion around what is realistic, what is necessary, and being able to make very compelling arguments for why. Catherine, do you want to go from there? Sure. And, and I might just expand on what Nick's saying um, with an example. And so one technology policy that I think is one that people will often push back on me when I talk about this program is Agile. And they'll say, you know, Catherine, we don't need digital product managers because we're an Agile shop, right? So we've implemented Agile practices. And, and the reality is that Agile is a project management capability, right? It, it informs the technology organization how they're going to build a new technology capability. So there's great practices within the agile as a kind of a policy or an approach that you're going to use. But what this program is going to teach you is that, you know, even if you adapt, uh, you know, adopt agile practices, it doesn't give you what you need to manage the organizational change. And so we have to have sort of another side to that coin that says, okay, even if the technology organization builds, you know, solutions that are really driven by what users want and involve people in that process, that doesn't naturally say it's going to break down all the organizational barriers to try and put that new capability in play. And so we need to bring to the table the whole idea of, you know, sort of agile principles work, but what, how do they connect to these sort of more change management principles to complete the life cycle? And that's a real advocacy, I think, that you can take as coming out of this program is that we start to really think about what these different policies and practices are. Like even Nick and I talk a lot about security, right? Security can be something that can shut down a product. If your technology team comes in and tells you all the things you're not allowed to do, but we, we need to be able to break some of those orthodoxies and really try and push back on some of our security protocols so that we can find ways for these digital products to really allow the organization to explore new value propositions. And so those are just a couple examples about how we come at these existing policies. And you know, I see them as an orthodoxy. I see these whole you know, set of policies and practices that we have, we're sort of stuck in them and they're habitual and we lean on them. And, and in this program, we push on them, right? We say, what do we like about them? And then, you know, how do we need to think about this a little bit differently? And that's why I referred to it earlier as a modern management practice, right? Is because a lot of these things are changing the way we've done things um, in previous years. Thanks for that, Catherine. Sorry, I just had an issue coming off mute there. Nick, Nick and Catherine, I appreciate both your responses to that question. It adds a lot of depth and context, so greatly appreciated. The, the next question here is more tactical, and it pertains specifically to the practicum element of the program, and it's kind of a two-pronged question. Um, first thing is, does the program, does the MDPM program team identify the experiential learning opportunities, i.e., do we provide the teams with the clients? And then as a follow-up to that, once the client has been determined, uh, do the students and the student teams have a great deal of autonomy throughout the discovery, design, build, and application phases of the particular product itself? So, Catherine, you might want to get us started there. Sure. So, I'll start with the first, um, the first question. And so, the um, and just remind me that Connor, it was about whether or not those projects are predefined, right? Exactly. Yeah. Whether we provide the, the student teams with the clients, or they have the ability to source out their own clients. Yeah. So, so. You know, um, the one thing that's important to mention, I think, is in the first year, we're only taking a class of 40. And so that means that we have six or seven projects. Nick and I, there's a lot of demand for these. And so we do have demand 
But that's not to say if you're interested and you kind of want to come in with a project from your own organization, we it, there's still time to talk about that. But I expect that that time will be very short lived because we do have a number of projects that are already backing up um, to guide that experiential learning stream. The second question is extremely interesting to me because I would say if we were to let you loose to be able to ideate outside of the organizational reality, then we wouldn't be true to ourselves, right? Like, like the whole point of digital product management is you have to see this from the company perspective, the business perspective, as much as we see it from the user's perspective. So it has to be viable, right? We can't just, you know, kind of think about the most desirable way forward. So we have to be viable, but that doesn't mean we're not going to push on some of the organizational expectations if we see them being problematic. So we have to stay within the confines, right? The whole idea of, you know, these great, amazing digital products that don't actually ever get adopted into companies is why we've got such poor, you know, 16% of these things actually succeeding. But that's not to say we won't push. And it's not to say we won't push on kind of the assumptions and get that organization thinking about maybe the ways that they're holding this opportunity back. Great. Thank you, Catherine. We have one last question here. It's one. Oh, we actually have a couple questions, but there is a question here that's clearly someone was paying very close attention. There's a fine point on the very last slide that someone picked up on. So again, thanks for paying such close attention throughout the entire duration of the presentation. Um, the question is that the fine point mentioned there being fees are subject to board and on Ontario government approval. When is this approval coming and do you anticipate that the fees um, will change in any way. So the final approval, it's already been fully approved by Queen Senate. So it's been approved throughout the entire Central University the program has. Uh, we're just waiting for the final approval from the government of Ontario, which will be at the end of this month. Um, so we expect that rubber stamping to take place and the program to go into official full effect. And we also don't expect the, the tuition fees to change at all either. Another program, another question here, sorry. Um, is there a co-op or internship element of this program over and above the practicum? Uh, no. So there is, that's a quick answer to that. No. Final Although question. I would say that oh, the, the, um, the project has a lot of the elements you might expect from a co-op in that it is um, a real project with a real um, customer um, with industrial advisors helping you through the, the project. So it gives you a lot of the things you might expect from a co-op, but given the one year, um, time duration of the program doing a, you know, sending you out for three year, months to work in a, pro, a company, for example, wouldn't be realistic. Great, thanks for that. So the final question here, at least the ones that we have in the queue, um, pertains to digital transformation. Since digital transportation uh, transformation is an important component of this program, I see digital transformation as a phase within the organizational life cycle. So I think he's just hoping to pick Catherine and Nick's brains as to how they see the application of digital transformation, maybe currently within industry and how that will change over the coming 10 or 15 years here. Yeah, so Hemad, I'll start by, so there's a video on, the, on our website that is where we unpack some terminology. And in that video, we unpack the difference between digital transformation and this idea of digitalization. And so the program teaches you how to digitalize phenomenon within the business. So if you think about, you know, an organization and the number of things that they need to do to kind of make that business process more relevant for the digital age, that's digitalization. So we're digitalizing many things, remote work, the way we learn, the way we serve our customers. And over time, those digitalization efforts will allow an organization to transform. And so I, I love this question because I think, I think we agree, right? I, we're like, this is a, the phase that we're teaching is digitalization. The practice we're teaching you to digitalize this phenomenon is digital product management. So you have to do a number of those phases in order for an organization to transform into the digital age, right? That could take 10, 15 years, depending on how many of these little digitalization efforts you need to succeed through. Excellent. So it's one minute before 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, which means that we kind of landed the plane perfectly here. Uh, thanks again for everyone's participation. Great questions. 
um, towards the end here. We really appreciate the dialogue. As I mentioned at the start of the presentation of the webinar here, we will be emailing everyone who registered a virtual video copy of the, of the entire uh, webinar. So kind of look forward to that in your inboxes within the next 24 hours here. I'll also have our colleague Ryan Horvay who will be responsible for emailing out the webinar to include my personal professional email address so that you can get a hold of me if you'd like to have a virtual consultation or talk about potentially applying for the program. I'll provide you with that with that contact so that you can please reach out and get a hold of me if you have any further questions um, going forward. But again, we just wanted to thank you for taking the time to join us today for our first ever, ever web webinar. We hope that you're ex as excited about the MDM pro program as, as we are. And just we wish you the, the, the great afternoon and the rest of your day. And uh, we hope to be in touch again soon going forward. So thanks again.